All right. Good morning, everyone, uh, or at least those of you in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to those of you in the Eastern Hemisphere, and welcome to this, uh, the fourth of eight webinars that we're doing this month on the XX Network. My name is Peter Somerville, and I'm part of the Praxis team, um, and I'm going to kick off the webinar here this morning. Um, so first of all, those of you joining us live, you'll see on your, your Zoom screen at the bottom, both a chat box and a Q&A box. Um, our intent is to kind of focus Q&A uh, questions and answers to the end of the webinar, but please, please communicate by uh, chat and by Q&A throughout our conversation, and we're looking forward to answering your questions. Uh, the rules for today's webinar are pretty simple. Number one, we're excited to have a real great back and forth with you all and, and discussing and getting into the details here. And we simply ask that we keep the discussion respectful of everyone who's participating. And second, we're focused on the technical details, the technology that's going to bring to life the XX network. This is not a forum for us to discuss any kind of coin sale. And so nothing in this conversation should be taken as investment advice, nor as a solicitation to purchase any kind of financial product. And so again, we've got other areas for that discussion. This is not the part the place for it. So with that, let's kick this off. Uh, our next slide here, we've got the faces who will be speaking to you this morning. Uh, I'm down in the bottom left corner. Again, my name is Peter Somerville. Uh, I run and help to build the node and developer community uh, around the XX network. If you're a node operator or a developer, I'm happy, always happy to talk to you about that. Joining me this morning, first is Will Carter, the Chief Operating Officer of Praxis. Uh, Will uh, has kind of guided the development of, of the Praxis technology. He comes from a background at NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Also joining us is Ben Wenger, who's the VP of Architecture at Elixir. Um, ben comes to us with a great elect electrical engineering background, has really helped to build out the AlphaNet, which hopefully you guys have had a chance to sample through the XX Messenger. Um, we also have with us uh, Bernardo Cardoso. Bernie uh, is a senior software engineer at Praxis, uh, has a lot of experience with decentralized network uh, design. Uh, we'll be sharing some of those kind of details about Praxis with us this morning. And last but not least is Mario Costa, who's a cryptographer with the Praxis team. He's got some great published work uh, with David Chom, and we're excited to have all of them joining uh, us today, just as they're excited to share this work that we've been working on for really the past months and in some cases years. And so it was really exciting for us to bring these details to you. And then the next slide provides kind of an overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. Again, the, the title of this is the deep dive. And so if this is your first exposure to the XX network, I also recommend checking out our, our technical documents, our white paper, and then also I'll post a link down in the chat box uh, to the Praxis YouTube page, which has uh, our first webinars, which were a little bit more of an overview. Uh, but today we're gonna kind of try to get a little bit more into the, the details with you all, talking about the XX coin, its role within our network, how our consensus protocol works, how does communication within the XX network work, and then how do those different pieces fit together? And so the goal is to, for us to speak for about an hour, and then we're happy to stay and answer your questions. And that, of course, provides really valuable feedback for us. What are the areas that we can expand on in greater detail? The next slide has sort of a schematic of the key role here. And so these boxes with the rounded corners are, are all nodes within the XX network. And so you can see the central kind of backbone role that they play. You've got mixing teams at the top, uh, you know, running the Elixir CMIX technology to mix messages. That's what destroys the metadata. Um, you've got the work of the block producer creating each block. On that second kind of row, you've got the endorsers who verify uh, that the block producer is going to do a good job. And that leads to block creation throughout the blockchain. So that's kind of the overview. And we're going to be diving into each of those roles. How does it work? And so to kick it off, uh, we're going to transfer over to a discussion of the XX coin. 
Okay, so let's dive into the XX coin, which is the quantum secure denominator, the currency that runs on the XX network. So I'm going to talk about the potential coin structures that we envision for the platform. I'm going to give a brief overview on quantum secure signatures, how they work, what security properties they give us. And then I'm also going to look at a denominated coin transaction so that we can actually see how a transaction works on our platform. So just to give some context, I want like just to mention that we're going to talk about the currency component of that overview diagram we saw. So when we like we're coming up with a system, we came up with some potential coin structures. So for now we have three. The first one is denominated coins. These are the most similar ones to the actual physical cash you find out there. So, but instead of using like five or $10, we use denominated like base two numbers. So we use one, two, four, and we also support fractions. These take full advantage of the Elixir privacy. So the Elixir mixnet that will be described later in this presentation goes perfectly along with the denominated coins that we designed for the platform. Then we have wallets. Wallets is the most popular thing out there. When you think of a blockchain, you have a wallet. These are basically multi-use addresses that you use to send or receive some type of digital cash. Now, this is very peculiar for us because here we are using one-time signatures, but we want this to be multi-use. So we had to tweak this a bit. So we built incorporated like a list of hash-based public keys that you can use. So each wallet address is actually tied to a list of keys that you can use. These offer slightly less privacy. These are a very useful like, use case that you can find in our platform. Then we also support multi-signatures. These can be either denominated or wallet-based. These support the vast majority of use cases. So you can support escrow, joint custody, even smart, smart contracts. So we do this by requiring signatures from different parties in order to spend these addresses. So why a quantum secure currency? So quantum computers are closing in and the algorithms that run on these computers can actually break a lot of the cryptographic primitives out there. So as you're probably familiar, Shor's algorithm or even Grover's algorithm, they are serious threats to present day cryptography. So as an example, Shor's algorithm can break the discrete logarithm problem and the factorization of large primes. So to solve that, we use one-time hash-based signatures. More concretely, the Watts Plus scheme. This was introduced in 2013. This is a very interesting scheme with very solid security proofs. So we decided to go super safe, very well-established platform, a uh, very well-established scheme. And this is the one we use. So first I want to like look at hash functions. What is a hash function like and what properties we can have from here? So a hash function is no more than a one-way function that converts an input string of any length and produces a deterministic fixed size output. So if I hash Mario right now, and if I hash it tomorrow or next week, the output should always be the same, therefore deterministic. And where are the security requirements we want from this? First, we would like it to be pre-image resistant. So if you have a hash output in this example, the hash of Mario, you should not be able to invert it. We would also like this to be second pre-image resistant. So given an input, in my example, Mario, you should not be able to find another name or another input that maps to that same hash output. So you're not, you should not be able to find the collision with the constraint, with this constraint. Then you have collision resistance. This is very similar to the previous definition, but it's a bit more powerful because here the adversary has full control. So the, the attacker can choose any set of inputs and it just has to try to find one collision. We're gonna focus here more on the second pre-image resistance side because this is the more important definition that we need for the signature scheme. And I wanna like give a very interesting example here. So there's the hash function called MD5. And this was broken many, many years ago. There were multiple collisions have been found throughout the years. However, the second pre-image resistance of MD5 still remains an unfeasible challenge. No one has been able to find the second pre-image in that hash function construction. So just to have some ideas of how strong this requirement that we have for our scheme is. So let's talk about some hash-based signatures examples. So out there you can find a Lamport signature scheme, the Winternet one-time signatures, Winternet one-time signature plus, it's in bold because it's the one we use, extended Merkle signature scheme and the Sphinx. So why are they quantum resistant? Basically to attack the Watts plus signature scheme, 
and attacker must brute force and find the second pre-image, this challenge that I just described. So just to give some context, if you're dealing with 180 bit hash, a quantum computer must perform two to the 90 work. As an example, the Bitcoin network right now is roughly producing two to the 80 per year. So you could literally convert the entire Bitcoin network to quantum and it would still take them thousands of years to break one of our addresses. That's how serious we take security in our company. Now I wanna talk about lamp or signatures and I wanna go really slowly here. So this is the hash based signature scheme. And I also wanna point out something very important. Basically every digital signature scheme out there starts by hashing the message to be signed. And then they apply some type of mathematical property. We just use hash functions. That's it, the end. So Lamport in 79 created a signature scheme purely based on hash functions that allows people to sign messages. In this example, I'm gonna show how key generation, signing and validation work for an eight bit message. So we want to sign eight bits. So first we want to generate 16 secret values. So two times the number of bits we want to sign. This is the secret key. Then the public key is the hash of each of these secret key values. So you basically perform 16 hashes. Then the signing, and I wanna give a very concrete example here. We're gonna sign the letter X. The letter X in binary is this sequence of bits. So it's zero, one, 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 zero, zero, zero. So how do you sign a message using a lamp or signature scheme? You go through every single bit of the message that you want to sign, and then you release the corresponding secret key, depending whether it's a zero or a one. So let's look at our example. The first bit, it's a zero. So it's gonna come from the purple set. Second bit, it's a one. It's gonna come from the blue set. So you keep going through every single bit and you can see it's a one, it comes from the blue set. One, one, always blue. And then once we get to zero again, it goes to purple. This is the signing process. How do you verify that the signature is valid? So you basically get that signature from the previous step and you hash each of those secret values that was released for every bit. If that hash is present in the public key, then it's a valid signature. If not, then you should ignore it because that's not valid. So how does the denominated coin transaction on our platform work? Basically, here we're gonna show the transaction from Alice, address A, to Bob, address B. Here, Alice is gonna sign using her key the transaction. And what is exactly the transaction? It's no more than Bob's address. So Alice signs Bob's address, sends it to the platform. The platform receives this transaction, checks if the signature is valid, and it, there's enough currency there. If so, it just replaces Alice's address with Bob's address. This is it, as simple as it gets. That's how a transaction works on our platform. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Will, who's gonna talk about the XX consensus. All right, thank you, Mario. So in this portion of the webinar, we're gonna talk about XX consensus, which is the first and only consensus protocol with the speed, scalability, and security to really support the mainstream adoption of blockchain technology. So to do this, I'm gonna quickly review the requirements that we identified in the last webinar, uh, which we view as being critical to this mainstream adoption. And then I'm gonna outline the approaches that we use to meet these requirements. And once we've set some of the context here, Bernie, Mario, and myself will break down these five approaches uh, at knee deep level, and then walk you through a simplified consensus round. So first, let's take a look at the big picture so we can see where consensus fits in. Consensus in the XX network describes the process of selecting nodes to gather transactions, and proposing them to the network um, where they are verified and confirmed before they become a part of the blockchain. Keep in mind, we will examine each of the subcomponents shown here and we'll bring up this diagram periodically to kind of show you what portion of consensus we're referring to. So these are those requirements we laid out in the last webinar, and I think it's important to go through and refresh on why these are important, how they stack up with the three properties I mentioned on the intro slide, 
Um, but I also recommend people go and watch the presentation that David gave while he received the Dijkstra Award in Amsterdam. And this should be the first video that pops up if you Google David Chum CWI. Um, maybe one of the moderators can throw it in the chat channel. Uh, but David does a great job of laying out the vision for the platform. So the first property we need is speed. If we're going to replace the centralized infrastructure we currently use, the platform cannot feel significantly slower than the technology we've grown accustomed to. So user experience is key to gaining mainstream consumer adoption, and part of that UX is quick, responsive apps and payments. In order to meet this, we need consensus to reach finality in seconds and support many thousands of transactions a second. The next is scalability, and you'll hear a lot about this when it comes uh, in, not only in the blockchain space, uh, but anytime you hear about consensus. And that's because it's an important aspect of decentralization, um, this, this notion of having the opportunity as a user to own and operate a node in the network. So having a large number of widely distributed nodes that are independently operated is important not only to keeping the network decentralized, but also for keeping the network robust which is in our last property, and that is security. So robust refers to the network's ability to continue operating securely uh, in the face of disruption. That disruption could be from malicious nodes, malicious users, an unreliable network, or even a nation state adversary. Now robustness combined with quantum security ensures that the wealth and data that users push through the platform remains safe well into the future. And Mario already touched on quantum security and it's important uh, it's importance, but it's also important to note that post-quantum crypto is generally pretty unwieldy, and that's because the signatures are much larger and can only be used once. Because of this, you cannot retrofit existing platforms to be quantum secure without introducing some major performance issues. So consensus, consensus should be designed with quantum security in mind, and that's kind of what we've done here. So these are our requirements. Uh, now we're going to take a look at the approaches we've used to achieve them. All right, so these are those five approaches we use to create the XX consensus. I'm just going to touch on each of these briefly since we're going to dig into them in a little more detail later on. Uh, the first is NodeCon, and this is a way to securely initialize the network and also to seed randomness we use for consensus, which is our next approach. Committed randomness is a way to generate global randomness every block, and we do this by chaining off the NodeCon random. The third is compact endorsements, and these are a way to prove finality in a compact but quantum secure manner. Fourth, and most importantly to our performance claims, is endorser sampling, and this uses committed randomness to select a random set of nodes to take on the resource intensive process of receiving and verifying transactions. And last, Efficient fallbacks are kind of the way we use to quickly recover from disruptions during consensus. All right, so let's start directly with the blockchain component of consensus and show you how it gets uh, initialized. So a quick definition for those of you who don't know what a blockchain is, a blockchain is simply a way to immutably publish data in chunks or blocks. That is to say, once data is published in a block, it cannot be changed. This immutability is derived from hash functions, which Mario covered and I'll touch again on briefly, but each block in the blockchain contains a hash of the block before it. And because of the properties of hash functions, it is impossible to go back and change a prior block without changing the blocks later in the chain. So generally in a blockchain, initialization means signing and publishing a genesis block, uh, which you see here is the first block with the initial minted coins in the network. So now we're here at um, the XX network, we, we really spent some time thinking about what this network initialization should look like and how we could kickstart the network in the most secure way possible. And so NodeCon is how we propose to do this, and we envision it as one or more physical events where users and nodes can attend, learn how to run a node, how to participate in governance, and how to develop on the platform. More importantly, because the nodes attend in person, they can establish some primitives that will be used throughout the lifetime of the network in a quantum secure and trustless manner. 
So let's take a look at what those are. The first is critical to consensus, and that's generating a secure random seed, which we call the NodeCon random. This seed will be used throughout consensus and we'll go into that a bit later. Uh, how do we generate this seed? First, we need to understand a simple approach and we call that the hash commit. And hash commits are used extensively throughout our consensus and at NodeCon, uh, so it's important to really understand them. Uh, luckily, they're very, they're very simple to understand. It's just a way for a node to publicly commit to a secret value without revealing the secret itself. So a node can generate a lot of secret values, hash them, and then share the outputs with the rest of the world. And when that node is called upon to reveal one of those secrets, the public can verify that it hasn't been modified because they can hash the secret and check the output against the public commit that was shared. This makes use of the two properties of hash functions that Mario mentioned. First, they're not reversible. Given a public commit, nobody is able to reverse engineer it and find the secret value. And second, they're deterministic. If the secret value has not been modified, it will always result in the same public commit when hashed. So again, using these two properties, we can have nodes commit to secret values that they will reveal at a later date but are unmanipulatable because anyone can verify that they match the public commits. Now, each of these nodes is gonna to have to generate a lot of these commits. So obviously we need an efficient way to publish these to the rest of the network without having to share each and every commit. To do this, we use a structure we call, well, is commonly called a Merkle tree, uh, which you see to the right, this is used extensively um, in any hash-based uh, cryptography. And this is a small tree that we show here, uh, but can, it can be expanded to hold as many commits as needed. And the magic of this tree is that you only need to share the root of the tree in order to commit to all the leaves below it. So let's take a look at how that works. Now, you'll notice that we have these little H symbols. These mean hash. And each node in this tree is the hash of the two children nodes below it. And since a node only shares the root of the tree uh, with the rest of the network, we need a way to prove that any secret values that it reveals were actually committed to by that root since we didn't share the entire tree. Now, in order to do this, we use something called a Merkle proof, which is just a clever way to prove that a node is in a tree without seeing the tree using the hash. And, and we do this using the hash property of the tree. Um, so say I want to reveal this first secret value. With it, I will send the public commit here and also the node here. And with these three pieces of information, I can tell that this secret commit or the secret value uh, was committed by this root. And we do that by first being a recipient of this, I'll hash the secret value. I'll end up with this public commit. When I hash these two public commits, I'll end up with this node. And when I uh, hash this node and this node, again, we provided this node with the secret value, I end up with the commit root. And if this commit root matches what was committed by the node, then I know that that secret value was not modified or manipulated in any way. So all the nodes in the network will commit to a placard tree shown here on the right before NodeCon. And you'll notice we have a subtree specifically for NodeCon secrets and their commits. Now, if you remember, the first thing we're trying to do at NodeCon is generate a secure random value. And in order to make this unmanipulatable by any party, we want every node who attends to be involved in generating it. We do this by having every node submit one of these secret values in their NodeCon tree. We publicly combine all these values into a single random value uh, using a hash function or say a, an XOR. And because these values were committed beforehand, anyone can verify that they haven't been manipulated to influence the random. So basically everyone who attends NodeCon will take a value, a secret value from this NodeCon root tree. They'll all combine it together uh, using a hash function or an XOR function into a single value. And what's really cool about this is that even if all the nodes except one in the network or except one who attended NodeCon uh, are to collude to influence this random, that single honest node is enough to make sure that the results are unpredictable. And so using this approach, we now have a very secure random value. 
Next, once we have the secure random seed, we're going to create quantum secure authenticated channels between all nodes. This allows nodes to communicate with each other during consensus uh, while ensuring that the messages they get from other nodes uh, actually come from the node they're expecting it to come from and that they haven't been manipulated. And we're gonna do this in a very similar way as we generated uh, the NodeCon random, where each node will meet with every other node and they'll exchange a secret but committed value. And when these nodes go home, they can XOR the or hash uh, the values together and the result will be a quantum secure symmetric key that only they know and that did not rely on any trusted infrastructure like say a key server to generate. And third, and it kind of looks like a joke, but this is actually um, a powerful way to mitigate Sybils in the network. Uh, we have this process of meeting every other node in the network in person. Um, and we do this through, as we mentioned, the creation of quantum secure authenticated channels. You'll actually, each node in the network will physically meet every other node in the network. Um, and this gives them a chance to kind of see that this is a real person. Uh, it's not just a, a group of nodes that have been spun up by a single party. Um, and this is how we kind of mitigate Sybils in the early network, which in many ways is uh, the time period when the network is kind of most vulnerable. And so once we've accomplished all this, the final task is to collectively sign the Genesis block. And this will contain the tree of initial minted coins, the initial list of nodes in the network, and the NodeCon random we generated. And then finally, the drinks and hors d'oeuvres can begin. Uh, once we have that NodeCon random and membership list signed into the Genesis block, we can start consensus and we've really seeded our next approach. Um, and we call this approach committed randomness. So we've already talked about how this first block was formed uh, through this NodeCon process. So now we're going to talk about how the chain of these blocks is formed, um, this blockchain. And we start by looking at how we randomly select the node who proposes each block. And as you might guess, that's using committed randomness. And we've already talked a little bit about what committed randomness is in these trees. But now I'm really going to explain how it's used during consensus to randomly select nodes for certain tasks. So you'll recognize this image from NodeCon. All nodes in the network have committed to a placard tree like this. And each of these trees has three committed subtrees. And we looked at the NodeCon tree already. Um, we're going to look at the randoms tree next. But before I do, I do want to mention the three entities uh, in the network because they'll be used throughout the rest of the presentation. So it's important to understand what they are and what they do. Uh, the block producer is the leader of each round. They're responsible for proposing the block and revealing a secret value from that random tree, which we'll go into in a moment. The endorsers are a randomly selected uh, set of nodes which verify the signatures in the transactions that the BP proposes. And as you might guess, Sorry about that. And as you might guess, this random selection uses the committed randomness approach I'm about to describe. Finally, the network is the collection of all the nodes in the network. So this is just every node in the network. Uh, this includes the BP and the endorsers for the round. And they confirm that the endorsement was successful. So every node in the network has an equal opportunity to be the BP or an endorser. And this ties back to the egalitarian nature of our consensus, which was mentioned in the last webinar. And because of this, we don't suffer from centralization due to concentration of computing power, such as in proof of work, or from concentration of wealth, such as in proof of stake. And you'll remember that Mario talked about one-time use hash-based signatures, and that the particular protocol we use is called What's Plus. And because they're one-time use, we need to commit to a lot of public keys. And that's what that tree on the right is. The commitment to a lot of Watts plus public keys that we'll use throughout consensus. All right, with all that being said, let's take a look at this randoms tree. Now, you'll already notice that this is organized in a slightly different way than the NodeCon Merkle tree. 
uh, the leaves here on the node country or the leaves on the node country were committed to uh, secret, there were commitments to secret values. And here the leaves of this tree are commitments to ladders of secret values. And it's a small but important distinction um, where each one of the values here is actually a hash of the rung below it. So for example, round, round five is a hash of round six, round four is around a hash of round five, and then the root here is a hash of round four. And this is just another way for us to compress a lot of commitments uh, into a smaller tree. Um, but what's important to note here is that each node has a commitment for every round or block. And if that node is chosen as the BP for a round, then they are required to reveal the committed random in their ladder that corresponds to the, to the round. So if a node is selected to be the BP for round five, they're gonna reveal the committed random for round five, and we call this the BP reveal. So just, just to reiterate that, we know every single round a BP is expected to reveal a secret random value that they have committed to, and we call it the BP reveal, which we show here. So using that BP reveal, uh, this diagram shows us how we apply it to every single round to generate unmanipulatable and unminable randomness. And you'll notice that this is very similar in structure to a blockchain where every random is a hash of the random before it. And so going forward, we're gonna call this a randomness chain. Now, the random that we generate in every block is used to select two things. It selects a new BP and a new set of endorsers for that block. We're only going to show the case where the BP is not malicious and actually does reveal the random, but later on, Bernie's going to examine what happens if the BP does not reveal the random. So you'll notice that this chain starts with the node con seed, and this is imperative to the validity of the chain. If an adversary could manipulate this random seed and mine their random reveals, they could influence and choose only malicious nodes going into the future and the security of the network would be at risk because they could select only bad BPs and uh, a threshold of bad endorsers in each one of these subsets. And so this is why we took uh, that secure random seed generation at NodeCon so seriously. Uh, the seed chooses, this seed right here, chooses the first BP who proposes the first block. Uh, and he reveals, as we said, his BP reveal. And by hashing that BP reveal with the NodeCon seed, we get two things. We get the random for the next block, uh, but we also get the next set of endorsers. And that random for the next block in turn can be used to select the next BP who reveals their BP reveal, uh, which selects the set of endorsers for the block and also sets the random for that block as well. And this continues on uh, into the future. And this is how we select the BPs and the endorsers in our network. So with this in mind from here, Uh, Bernie is going to explain how uh, endorser sampling works, and we're going to look at the consensus loop itself. Okay. So what is endorser sampling? It's our key approach, and we want to really explain it well. So you can see again the diagram of the XX network, and here we can see endorsers are at the very core of our system. As you can see, some of these nodes are highlighted, and these are actually the endorsers which have been selected from the network. Now, this is exactly what the endorser sampling is. It's no more than the process of randomly selecting a constant number of nodes from the network that become endorsers for each round of consensus. Then these endorsers are responsible for validating the transactions which are included in the block proposal. If all of the transactions are valid, they will endorse a block by signing its hash and then sending the signature to the whole network. Endorser sampling is of paramount importance for our performance or excess consensus performance. For this, we can have an example to understand this. We can select 100 endorsers from a network of 1,000 nodes, for example. 
Now, these other endorsers are going to be very busy because they need to validate the signatures on each transaction, which is a very computationally expensive operation. Now, the remaining 900 nodes, however, they're only passively participating in consensus. They simply wait for block endorsements, so they, they don't need to validate transactions. This will free up their computational resources, which is very important for our system, as we will see later in this webinar. So by leveraging endorser sampling, excess consensus achieves linear scalability. So what is linear scalability? What is this buzzword that we talk about? Now, we have here an example of three scalability complexities that are usually found in consensus algorithms. We have constant, linear, and quadratic. In constant, it just means that a fixed number of nodes will need to communicate with another fixed number of nodes. So for example, one node communicating to two nodes. In linear, uh, and the constant number of nodes will need to communicate with every node in the network. So here in this case, we have one node communicating with all three nodes in the network. Finally, in quadratic, it means that every node in the network communicates with every other node in the network. So here we have three communicating with three, which totals nine communications. Now, the quadratic here doesn't seem to be a big issue. Uh, it's just like nine communications. However, this will change drastically when we increase the size of the network. Now we have the same diagrams here, but with a network of size seven. We can see that in constant and linear, it's still very uh, bearable. So we still have two communications here, and here we only have seven because that's the size of the network. However, now in quadratic, we have seven squared, which is 49 communications. We aren't even sure if we drew all of these edges in this diagram. So this is what provides our motivation for having a constant or linear scalable consensus algorithm. When we use endorser sampling, only the selected endorsers need to communicate with every other node in the network. And this allows us to achieve linear scalability. So you can see here, for example, if this is an endorser, it's going to communicate with all the nodes in the network. But these nodes in the network don't communicate with each other. In turn, if we take a look at these nodes, they actually only communicate back with the endorsers, which means that they achieve constant complexity instead of linear. So if now we take a look at this node and think, oh, this is a node in the network, is actually only talking to endorsers, which are a constant number. Now, when we measure performance of a consensus algorithm, the theory dictates that the worst case complexity always wins. This means that excess consensus is linear scalable. However, as we've just explained, only the endorsers have actual linear complexity. The rest of the network actually achieves constant com complexity. So in practice, this will lead to uh, uh, excess consensus performance to be closer to constant than linear, which is a very, very important problem. Now I will hand over to Mario, which is going to talk about of compact endorsement signatures. Okay, so we identified a problem. Basically, we need mobile users to be able to check that stuff is on the blockchain without actually using their entire data plan. So let's just give some context here. Let's talk about compact endorsement signatures. And these actually make, make it so that the blockchain is very light. So you can actually check that stuff is on the chain very quickly without using much data. Let's actually dive into this and see what this means. So first, Quantum secure hash-based signatures, like the Watts Plus, they have a couple of drawbacks. First, they're very large, especially if we compare them to standard elliptic curve signatures. There is no signature aggregation scheme for hash-based signatures. So just to give you some contrast, with elliptic curves, you can actually combine a couple of signatures and make sure that they all map to a curve so you can aggregate them and like have them in constant size. With hashes, you can't really do that. This is a problem because then it means you have to accumulate a lot of hash base signatures and to check that something is on the blockchain, this gets very big. So to actually solve this, we had to create our novel scheme. So we created the novel quantum secure hash based group endorsement scheme. So the way this thing works is endorsers will sign a hash of the block tied to their own secret. I'm actually going to show a diagram here so that we can actually look at this clearly. This has something very interesting. Each endorsement on its own, it's not secure, but when grouped with all the other endorsers, this forms a multi-party computation, secure signature, which is a very interesting property. <clears throat> 
So first, endorsers generate four secret keys here in the bottom, four only. For example, we saw in the Lamport signature scheme, they were actually generating 16 to sign eight bits. Here we're talking about signing a lot of bits only with four keys, that's it. You generate four keys, done, and then you hash them in the hash ladder style. So you go up, you hash them. In our case, you will hash each key 255 times and you will get to this top rung. So you'll have four top hashes. Then you're gonna do a little trick and you're gonna hash all of these four again so that you can compress this into just one value. This will be what we call their own secret element. Then you just hash this one again and that's the actual public key of the node. So to sign, you will be signing this block here. So you plug this into a hash function, you plug your secret value, and then you just sign that. That's the endorsement. So again, you generate four secret key values, you hash each of them 255 times, compress it into one, that's your secret commit value, and then just hash that again, and that will be your actual public key. This is a nice trick because it allows your public key to be very small, so it's not gonna be taking, taking a lot of space, but it still allows you to check that the signature is valid. So to sign, you just grab this little value here. No one can get to this because they just have access to the public key. And since this is one way, no one can actually see that value. So you plug that into a hash function, you plug a block with that, and then you just sign using hash space scheme, that endorsement. This will result in a very compact proof, especially on an individual endorsement basis. But as a whole, this is completely unforced, like un unbrute forceable. So now I wanna go a bit into the XX consensus. And we have talked about the block producer, the endorser sampling, the Genesis block and the actual blockchain. So I wanna give even more context. I wanna start with network assumptions, talk about the adversarial model, then just dive into some data structures and entities we have in our system. So first, network assumptions. We assume a partial synchrony network model. What does this mean? that we tolerate that at some points in the, in the network functioning, the network will not be in synchrony. But after some time, we, what we call GST, global civilization time, nodes will be able to like resume the conversation and catch up with like what actually happened. We take the classical Byzantine assumption, n equals three F plus one. So basically, if we have F nodes in the network, to properly function, we need three F plus one total network size. And obviously, as a platform that wants to be robust and at global scale, we need to tolerate network failures. So our network might actually fail to deliver message, delay message, duplicate them, or even deliver them out of order. This is okay, it can happen, we tolerate this. Adversarial model. First, the adversary controls every single malicious node in the network. And moreover, it's actually able to instantly modify their state. The adversary also has the ability of viewing the state of every honest node at any time. And finally, the adversary is able to break all crypto that relies on the hidden subgroup problem. This is just a fancy terminology for the adversary has a quantum computer that can break the discrete logarithm problem or the factoring of large primes. I'm gonna hand it over to Bernie to actually dive into the data structures and take it from here. Thank you, Mario. So during the operation of XX consensus, there are three data structures involved, the transactions, the state update, and the block. First, we have the transactions, which are the largest piece of data that needs to be shared in the network. And this is because they have a very large quantum secure signature. We organize all these transactions in a Merkle tree. So sending all this information to every node in the network would impact XX consensus performance. So transactions are only sent to the endorsers, which validate them. But other nodes still need a way to update the state of their ledger. So in order to do this efficiently, we actually found a way to compress the transactions, so to speak. Each transaction contains a destination address. And from its signature, we can also extract the source address. So these two addresses are enough information that, to represent that transaction, so we don't need to keep the signature. We then organize this list of compressed transactions in another Merkle tree and call it the state update. Finally, we have the block, which as you can see is extremely small. 
we actually try to represent all of these to scale, but it turns out that if we wanted to see the block, the transactions will take up the entire slide. The block which simply contains a new random value and the Merkle roots of the state update and the transactions. So this will create an immutable link between all the data that's processed in a consensus round and the block. So this allows excess consensus to just reach agreement on this block and produce a very small proof of finality for it. This is of extreme importance in the mobile world. So mobile clients only need to download a very lightweight blockchain and all the blocks are very small. And so are their proofs of finality. And this means that you can verify your own transactions without ever needing to see all the other transactions that were processed in each block as you do in other blockchain platforms. So now we will dive into the actual intrinsics of the XS consensus algorithm. We'll start by describing how it works under normal network conditions. We call this the optimistic path, and it's divided into four major phases. Propose, validate, confirm, and commit. In the proposed phase, the leader of consensus, which is the BP, will send its block proposal to the network. The BP proceeds in the following manner. It just validates the transactions and will discard all the invalid ones. Then he builds the block and the state update with only the valid transactions. Finally, he will send this block and state update to the whole network while only sending the transactions to the endorsers in parallel. And then once the endorsers have received the transactions, they enter the next phase of consensus, the validate phase. In this phase, the endorsers simply validate the transactions and will endorse the block proposal. They validate signatures on these transactions, check if the current state of the ledger confirms that the source address has enough funds to carry out the payment. And then if all are valid, they will just sign the block hash and send this signature, which is an endorsement, to the rest of the network. In order to have confidence that a block is actually valid, nodes in the network can trust a single endorser. Instead, they need to gather a quorum of endorsements. This is simply a minimum required percentage of signatures from the endorser set, for example, 65%. And this parameter is uh, tuned so that we have a probability of failure in our system on the order of once in many million years. Then any node that has reached a quorum of endorsements can move on to the next phase of consensus, which is the confirm phase, where nodes in the network will confirm back to the endorsers, telling them that they've seen a quorum of endorsements and therefore are ready to accept the BP's proposal. So basically after a node sees this quorum, they just create a small confirmed signature on the block hash and send it to all of the endorsers. Then the endorsers need to wait to receive a majority of confirmed signatures from the network in order to maintain the safety of the consensus algorithm. To understand how this confirmed phase ensures safety, we need to briefly explain the concept of Byzantine fault tolerance, or BFT. So under the influence of Byzantine actors, it is of paramount importance that a majority of nodes in the network agree on the same block. And this majority is actually two thirds plus one of the network, which has been proven to be the minimum necessary in order to achieve safe agreement under the BFT assumption. So to explain these two thirds plus one requirement, we can think of the following exercise. Let's have a small group of friends, four friends, which are trying to decide whether to have burgers or pizza for lunch. Two of the friends are Byzantine. This means that they can lie about their preference, while the other two friends are honest and they have publicly revealed that one of them wants burgers and the other wants pizza. Now, the Byzantine friends can separately talk with the honest ones and say they agree with their decision which leads each of them to believe that they have reached a majority with three votes. So the honest friends go ahead and will order their preferred food. And they later find out that there was a split decision. So they were actually misled by the Byzantine friends. This is what leads to forks in blockchain platforms where different nodes actually follow different decisions. However, if we now analyze the situation with only one Byzantine actor, we can see that only one set of this group will be able to achieve three votes, while the other one will only be able to have two votes. This means that it will always be safe to follow the decision that has reached the three votes, because three is the two thirds plus one majority of four. Now, if we go back to the confirm phase, uh, any endorser that has gathered this two thirds plus one majority 
we'll enter the final phase of consensus, the commit phase. In this phase, nodes will, on the network will gather another quorum of endorsements and will finalize a block. So endorsers will use the quantum secure uh, compact endorsement signature scheme that was described by Mario, and they sign the hash of the block, which certifies that the network should commit to it. Now, we already know that each of those endorsements alone is not safe, but if you again uh, form a quorum of these endorsements, it's completely safe and you can combine them into a proof of finality, which can be provided to clients. Finally, nodes will commit to the block in the blockchain and will execute the state update, bringing them to the latest state of the ledger. So now we have described how access consensus works in more of a procedural way. So we want to take a look out uh, of a timing diagram of a regular consensus round. It can be seen that the VP waits for the transactions and then it starts decoding them, which is basically validating them and sending them to the endorsers in parallel. Then it will build the block and the state update. So after the endorsers have received the transactions, uh, they will start decoding them right away. And in parallel, the BP is proposing the block and the state update to the network. This is very important because it means that once everyone in the network has seen the block, we want the endorsers to be able to quickly endorse the block. So then these endorse, confirm, and commit steps happen very fast. So this is stressing again that the bottlenecks of our system are uh, sending transactions and validating them. So we have now covered how the optimistic part works and covered all of these four approaches. So what's left is to analyze what happens when there's disruption in the network. And this brings us to the last of our key approaches, which is efficient fallbacks. So when the optimistic path fails to achieve agreement, excess consensus relies on efficient fallback mechanisms in order to make progress. This is very important as we don't want consensus to halt. The fallback is just a leaderless algorithm that relies on a second separate endorser sample. The second sample can only decide on an empty block. This is a different type of block. We haven't described it yet. It contains no data, so it doesn't change the state of the ledger. No transactions are processed in this round. It is deterministic, however, and this is what allows us to have a leaderless algorithm. This means that every node in the network knows what the empty block is supposed to be on every round. And we want this empty block because it allows us to keep the randomness chain going forward. Since we have these two separate samples that can only endorse a single binary outcome, so a normal endorser sample is gonna endorse the block proposal and a fallback endorser sample is gonna work on an empty block when things don't go as according to plan. We say that XX consensus is bistable. So now let's take a look at some cases that lead to the activation of this fallback mechanism. First, if a BP is offline or it creates a new valid block, the fallback endorsers are needed and in order to decide on the empty block, which keeps the randomness chain going. Another situation is if there are too many Byzantine endorsers that simply refuse to endorse the block proposal. In this scenario, a quorum of endorsements will not be reached, so the fallback endorsers will activate and decide on the empty block. A final situation is if an adversary actively attacks the network by creating a partition. In this case, nodes can actually follow separate paths. Some of them might think the BP is offline and start working towards an empty block, while others have actually seen the block proposal. But there is no problem. Once the partition ends, fallback mechanism ensures that excess consensus can recover and will reach an agreement on the BP's proposal. Now let's take a look at how the fallback endorsers are selected. This is the random chain diagram that represents normal system operation, as we've seen before when we'll explain it. So what happens to this chain if the VP does not reveal his random value? In this situation, there is no way of knowing the endorsers from this round R. So we need the fallback endorsers in order to make progress. However, since the BP can be offline, he is unre unreliable. So we can't rely on these BP reveal in order to select the fallback endorsers. So we just select them in advance. Basically, using the same block as we selected the BP, we select the fallback endorsers. These fallback endorsers will then decide on an empty block for this round three, which just contains a new random value. And this value is simply the hash of the previous random value. 
And now, based on this fresh random, we can proceed as normal and select a BP and fallback endorsers for round four. We can see in this case that fallback endorsers stay dormant because the BP actually reveal is random and consensus operates normal. Now we have an overview diagram of XX consensus. We are operating here in an optimistic scenario because the BP is online and he proposes a block to the network. His random reveal will select the endorsers shown here, which will validate the transactions and endorse the block, sending these signatures to the rest of the network. Once all of the nodes have seen the block and the quorum of these endorsements, the block will be finalized and the consensus round is done. You can see that the fallback endorsers were selected, but since there was no disruption, they just stayed dormant. Now, what happens if the BP is actually offline? There is no block proposal, so no random reveal, and you can see that no one in the network knows who's, who's the endorsers, who the endorsers are. And this is when we need a fallback mechanism. This is when the fallback endorsers show up. And they will try to commit an empty block, which keeps the random chain going. So these two overview diagrams cover the bistable operation of XX consensus. So now to wrap up the XX consensus part of the webinar, I'm going to talk about the properties we have achieved. First, we have achieved constant transaction communication complexity. This is because all of the very large transactions are only sent from the BP to the endorsers and never to the whole network. Furthermore, we achieved linear authenticator complexity. This means that in order to achieve agreement, nodes in the network only need to send or receive a number of signatures that is linear with respect to the size of the network. This is, if the network increases, so does the number of signatures we need to exchange, but never in a quadratic way. These two achievements are what allows us to scale very well, and these are both results of using endorser sampling as our key technique. Then, XX consensus is egalitarian. This means that no matter the stake that you put into the system, your power is always the same. So your probability of becoming a block producer, getting rewarded for that, or an endorser, is exactly the same. Then we have unmanipulatable randomness. This allows us to leverage the endorser sampling approach because if a BP would be able to mine a random value to choose only his friends, it could include any transaction he wanted and basically create money out of thin air because all of his friends will always say, oh, this all looks good, so our, your transactions are valid because they're the ones endorsing the block. Now, we prevent this because of the way we use NodeCon and committed randomness to create an unmanipulatable randomness chain. And this randomness chain provides us with the next property, probabilistically and predictable schedule. So in theory, when a BP is malicious, he has an option to decide on revealing his random or not. If he doesn't reveal his random, he will not be rewarded because he is not producing a block, but he knows that the efficient fallback will produce an empty block. And since this block is deterministic, he knows what the random value is, and he can try to predict one round in advance who the endorsers might be. However, this will only work if the next VP that was selected is also his friend. If he's not, if we have selected an honest VP, the, the, you will have a secret random value that will completely change the randomness in a way that is not predictable. So the probability that you can predict a BP or endorser scheduling ahead of time is very, very small. Finally, we also have quantum, quant compact quantum secure proofs of finality. This is very important for mobile clients and we use our novel compact endorsement signature scheme that Marius described in order to achieve this. We have now concluded the XX consensus part of the webinar. I will hand over to Ben, which is going to talk about XX communications. Hi, thanks Bernie and thanks uh, Will and Mario. Uh, so this is Ben from Elixir and I'm gonna talk a little bit about XX communication, our technologies, how they work and how they're implemented. So on the next slide, we can, we're gonna dive into what we're talking about. So we're talking about the mixing team, which is the component of the network which strips metadata and protects privacy. So the mixing team within 
the XX network is derived from a uh, type of an approach to privacy called a mixed network. And as you can see on the next slide, mixed networks were first introduced by our founder and CEO, David Chom, in 1979 with an academic paper in 1981. Now, the basic idea of a mixed network is simple. In this case, example here, we have three nodes mixing three messages, and each node reorders the message. Now, what you don't see on this diagram is that as they're reordering, they either decrypt or re-encrypt or encrypt these messages so that you can't do bit comparisons to, to see which input is which output. And then at the end, these messages come out unencrypted. And because of this repeat, uh, repetitive encryption, encrypting while mixing, it isn't really possible to determine the input to the output. Uh, and you know, this is a, an approach of three messages, but the alpha network currently running does this with a thousand messages simultaneously. So you know, the scale and scope of these are, are supposed to be quite large to make it very difficult to correlate inputs to outputs. Now, the classical problem with these mixing uh, uh, networks was that all of these encryption operations were normally done via public key cryptography. And this is quite slow. And due to the fundamental mechanisms, the times for these operations stacked. And as a result, for sufficiently large mixing to provide adequate privacy, the latencies experience have been historically too long to be commercially viable. And this resulted in a large number of other applications of uh, similar technologies. So things like onion routing were developed, which have less secure uh, privacy properties, but were scalable and feasible to use at a consumer scale, um, or at least attempted to. Uh, so what happened is in 2016, as we can see on the next slide, uh, David, uh, along with many others, published a paper about a new protocol called CMIX. And CMIX is fairly breakthrough because it takes this initial mixing infrastructure, one of the most private uh, networks ever designed, and figures out how to do most of the mathematical operations before messages are received. So while it still has to do all this work to be able to do the operations, the users of the network don't experience the latency associated. Now, the specific description of, uh, of CMIX also includes two other uh, properties, which further enhance its security and ensure that other avenues of attacking these mixed networks are thwarted. One is dealing with packet length, so there's uniform packet sizes. In the current uh, alphanet, they are 4,096 bits. And the second is packet timing, which is fundamentally solved by the mixing structure, which is that all the messages are received at the same time and then delivered at the same time. So it becomes significantly more difficult the larger the batch sizes to do correlations between inputs to outputs. Now, the specific implementation of uh, CMX as created by uh, Elixir uses end-to-end -end encryption as well. And we've, it's a modified version of many in industry standard approaches like what's used in WhatsApp and uh, Signal and Telegram with the fundamental difference that it has been tweaked to preserve privacy when used with Elixir. So I'm going to do, on the next slide, we're going to see a general uh, walkthrough of how CMIX uh, uh, works. So CMIX, unlike most systems, uses operates in what's called a modular cyclic group and uses modular multiplication and modular exponentiation. This is important because when you encrypt via multiplication, you get the commutative property, which for those of you who've not taken algebra for a long time, Commutative means that the order of operations can be reversed. So you can encrypt with one key, then encrypt with another, then remove the first key. And this is critical to how CMIX operates. This shuffling of keys allows it to gracefully replace um, uh, uh, keys and, uh, and operate on data without ever decrypting the underlying payloads. So as we can see in the next slide, this is exactly what CMIX does. So this is a simplified model, and I'm going to go through it, and then we're going to expand on it. Uh, so this first description uh, will have some flaws in it, and we will patch them. So you can imagine mixing as sending in three unencrypted messages. And as each message passes through, they're mixed and then multiplied with a key. 
So message one gets multiplied by A1, then B3, then C1. Now, no one knows what these keys are, so when these um, and they're reorganized, so you can't really tell input to output. But when messages come out, they're encrypted with a set of keys that no one knows what they are, so they can't ostensibly be decrypted. And this is actually what pre-computation buys us. What pre-computation does is it actually runs through this exact process beforehand without, um, um, with a null message, so in this case one, so that you have the combination of those keys known and you can just divide them out. Now, you actually can't use keys twice. So that pre-computation is done under a type of encryption called partially homomorphic encryption, which basically means that it masks these operations. So even though you're doing them twice, you don't lose any security properties. So um, you can think of pre-computation as basically making a template for that path by which the messages take during the pre-computation. And there's more information on the specific mechanisms. It uses some of the something called Elgamal. And there's a CMX academic paper which goes into details. And there is also uh, many of those developers of this system available on the XX network discord. So we'd be happy to go into more detail on pre-computation there. So what ends up happening with pre-computation is that it produces this chunk of keys that are kind of amalgamated together, which can't be split, but at the end can be used to undo the, the encryption added during the mixing process. But in the previous slide, what we saw was that as this mixing occurs, at least in that diagram, we passed in a, uh, um, an unencrypted message. And how CMIX actually works is, is that the messages do two passes. One, where they're encrypted for the team of nodes, and that encryption is swapped for other encryption, and the second, where it uh, mixes like this. So the input here is actually already encrypted, and the removed encryption is the sum encryption from two separate passes. So if we uh, go one more slide, um, we can see actually what pre-computation buys us. So in a conventional mix network, as we see on the top, the latency of, um, uh, uh, of the operations is quite long. It's the entire time it takes for all the mathematical operations to occur. But with pre-computation, because these operations are occurring beforehand, the actual latency experience is only what it takes to do these quick multiplies and the data traverse the network. So in the current alphanet, that real time takes about one second, while the pre-computation takes between five to eight seconds. But it's important to note that the two scale nonlinearly. So at significantly higher batch sizes, which we will be capable of doing uh, in beta net, as I'll explain uh, very soon, the time difference between real time and pre-computation will increase dramatically. So on the next slide, we can see that um, uh, pre-computation, as I discussed before, isn't just a single mixing phase, it's actually three phases. The first phase, is reception. This is when the messages are received encrypted for the network. Uh, that encryption is removed when more network encryption is added. The permutation phase um, is when it actually is mixed, further adding more encryption. Then the delivery phase is not a full network phase, but can be done just by a um, uh, by the last node. And this is where the results of the pre-computation are used to strip the um, uh, the network encryption from the message and reveal the underlying payload. Uh, now, it's important to note there's more complexity in here. Delivery has, has some other work, but uh, and some that's coming to CMIX paper as well as in the Elixir academic paper. So, sorry, the, the Elixir architecture brief. Um, so, on the next slide, we can see that we're going to start talking about how we actually use pre computation because if you've got one team that is pre computing the mixing, pre computing the mixing, pre computing the mixing, the fact that you can do that pre-computation beforehand doesn't buy you very much because you still have to wait for that pre-computation to occur. Within the, um, uh, the XX network, what's actually going to happen is that there'll be many teams and teams will be ephemerally formed. There'll be, uh, so let's say eight nodes will come together. They will do a single pre-computation and process the real time and then they will um, uh, disband to join more teams. So teams are temporary, they only process a single batch at a time, and they are formed through XX consensus uh, as part of the same fundamental protocols that select uh, endorsers or BPs. Now, okay, how did these teams actually work? So on the next slide, we, 
uh, we've got a, an example of how these actually scale. So in this description, I've taken some liberties, which is that we're describing the same team over and over again. And we'll kind of back out that description uh, um, uh, once this, uh, this general, the general idea of how this uh, scales has been expressed. So in the first example, there are uh, four teams. And the first team that goes, we're going to call the purple team. And what happens is that once it finishes the real time, it's scheduled to go four slots later. So it has the amount of time that it takes for four teams to do a real time to prepare its pre-computation. But in the second example, that same purple team is one of eight teams. So what happens is instead of having uh, three teams worth of time to, um, uh, to its pre-computation, it has seven teams real times worth of time to its pre-computation. And the larger the pre-computation, the more messages that can be processed in the real time. So what happens is that as you add more teams, the size of the batches, the anonymity increases, and the rate of processing of messages increases, uh, but the frequency that a single node operates decreases. So a single node ends up operating roughly over the same number of messages, but the network as a whole provides better anonymity and operates at a higher throughput. This is kind of like the, the, the fundamental scaling structure of CMIX and of Elixir, where as you add more nodes, its throughput increases. And this is very different from blockchains because CMIX is a mixed network, not a blockchain. It is a different type of decentralized structure, which fundamentally doesn't have a um, double spend problem. Messages don't need to be compared to every other message to be delivered. So um, if we look at the next slide, uh, what we're going to see is that the um, uh, that we're going to talk a little bit about the end-to-end -end encryption. So most of these systems have um, most privacy systems today rely solely on end-to-end -end encryption, um, which means that who communicates with who can still be uh, understood, which is called metadata. Now we have end-to-end uh, -end encryption as well, but it's slightly different in that it doesn't say who sent the message, just the key that they used to send that message. So when two users um, uh, want to communicate, as, as right now with the XX Messenger, they go through the user discovery protocol, which allows them to create a symmetric key. From this symmetric key, they generate a long list of encryption keys and then hash each one to create a fingerprint. When a message is sent from a user to a user, the message is encrypted with the key and they just tag on the fingerprint. Now this fingerprint only means something to the two users who know what the symmetric key is. So it allows the recipient to figure out who sent it, what key they use, and encrypt the message, but doesn't allow the network or any other party to see who sent it um, or who is receiving the message. Now you can see in the form we put below that the entire payload, including the end-to-end -end message and the fingerprint in the Mac, are encrypted by the K1, K2, K3, which is the network encryption, which we discussed earlier. Uh, so and that's, ba that's basically it. So this end-to-end -end encryption is implemented and actually being used right now within the XX Messenger. So the last thing we want to discuss, discuss are return paths. So after a batch is processed, um, the team doesn't just actually disband. They wait a few seconds and then process a return batch to the sender. This can be used in a few different ways, but is really important to the anonymity of the network because it allows the message to be sent to another party and that party to respond without the message revealing who that party is. So instead of using end-to-end encryption um, that we described before, you could just use public key encryption and then send the message and then receive it. So this can allow for the, for the creation of anonymous channels or just to send a single anonymous message to a party as will be used by user discovery. And as well as Praxis can use this to deliver proofs, which I believe they'll discuss uh, in a later slide. So overall, that, those are the basics of Elixir and its CMIX protocol. Um, there is an academic paper, as I said before, as well as the Elixir architecture brief, which goes into these various things in more detail. So uh, on the next slide, we're going to get into talking about Elixir and Praxis integration and how they work together. So the first thing we want to discuss about uh, how they work together are gateways. And this is kind of a miscellaneous thing which is important to our network, but is um, uh, not, uh, but we haven't covered yet. So nodes in the uh, XX network don't uh, directly communicate, they have a gateway. 
And these gateways act as the entry point for the network, and every node has its own gateway. So gateways are capable of running on cloud services and scaling, so they act as the network's DDoS protection, and they also act as the context point for the entire network, so for clients, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they also do a few other things. They store encrypted messages for access. Now, not every gateway doesn't store every single message. There's a partial uh, sharing, and that also is important for its privacy properties. They also can store blocks for public access. This is the point where if you want to download specific blocks, check them, you can. Um, it's important to note that they don't really hold any private keys or critical state. They're highly scalable, and they're not really the workhorses, they're the gateways. Um, so I think now I'm gonna pass off to Will to, uh, to discuss a few other integration properties. Thanks, Ben. All right, we're almost through this, so keep bearing with us. Um, right now, we've, just to recap, we've described the XX network components, um, which uses the groundbreaking mix network uh, from Elixir that Ben described to provide true privacy to communications. We've also described practices consensus and blockchain technology uh, which we believe is the only approach with the speed, scalability, and security to really support a mainstream global user base. And so to wrap things up, we're going to talk about some of the unique ways that Elixir and Praxis technology work together. Now, in that previous segment, Ben mentioned that mixed teams are unmanipulatable, and this is important in preserving the privacy of mixing. So, Generally, it is a significant challenge to create unmanipulatable randomness in a decentralized network. But luckily, if uh, you made it through and didn't fall asleep while I discussed committed randomness, then you'll remember that we can use that same randomness uh, that we use to schedule BPs and endorsers to actually schedule the, the mixed teams. And there is a key difference in how the mixed team scheduling works. And basically it relies on an approach we call geographic binning. And a geographic bin is a grouping of all the nodes that are located in a broad discrete geographical area. So for example, all nodes in Western Europe might be in the same geographic bin. And when we schedule nodes for a mixed team, we ensure that each node in the team is located in a different geographic bin. And this, allows us to do two things, or it accomplishes two things. First, it optimizes the network latency for communications between all, all team members. Um, and second, and more importantly, it ensures that the nodes are located across many different jurisdictions, making it difficult to force the nodes to break privacy. Now, speaking of privacy, next we're gonna look at how we leverage Elixir's mixing, we being uh, the XX network and Praxis technology, we leverage Elixir's mixing to provide privacy and payments. And so in this diagram, if we look in the center, we're gonna see a simple mix network of three nodes and they are processing a batch where two people are sending payments uh, along with a number of messages from other users. And we'll go into the importance of the messages in a moment, but first we're gonna focus on the payments. So purple and blue are sending payments of different total values. Purple is sending 3xx and blue is sending 6xx. However, these transactions are split up into denominated subtransactions that are uniform within their denomination. So the twos uh, should be indistinguishable um, from anyone monitoring the network or unidentifiable. When these coins are sent through the mix batch with the messages, it is impossible for nodes and anyone who's monitoring the network to differentiate which of the packets are coin transactions and which are regular messages. They just see, in this case, six indistinguishably encrypted messages. Um, but when the batch is mixed and the packets are partially decrypted, uh, which reveals the recipients, the network sorts the messages from uh, the payments and delivers the payments to the block producer to be processed in consensus. And because these coins were mixed with all the other coins, uh, many of which will be the same denomination. So I mentioned you would generally have a lot of one coins, a lot of two coins, a lot of four coins, et cetera. Um, it becomes probabilistically impossible for someone to distinguish which came, coin came from which person. Uh, furthermore, which I, without knowing which of these coins came from which person, it is impossible to figure out the total value of the payment that was made. 
Um, and this is where the messages come in. Um, I just talked about mixing up these messages um, in the mixing batch, but the messages are particularly important for our privacy claims because they give us a larger anonymity set than say a payments only platform um, where they're only sending coins through. Um, and this is simply because there are different use cases. Generally, any platform will send less money uh, through than say an instant messaging platform with the same number of users because you'll send, you know, um, maybe a message every couple seconds to your friends, whereas you're, you're, you're not sending that many payments throughout the day. Uh, so by leveraging the combination of both payments and messages um, in this mix batch, uh, we can provide much, much larger anonymity sets uh, than say a payments only platform or uh, another payments only blockchain would be able to provide. And so this is gonna be another way uh, in which mixing and consensus can work together. Uh, transaction ordering is something you'll hear a lot about in the blockchain space. The mix protocol we use allows us to do a couple of unique things in this regard. Uh, Elixir's technology outputs, if you remember, a batch of transactions. Um, so it receives the transactions, it batches it th them together, and then it releases them as a batch. Um, and these are all cryptographically guaranteed to have a particular order. Um, and that was that order that was set during uh, pre-computation. And so this is an ideal input for a blockchain. Um, so if you think about it, uh, a blockchain takes similarly a batch of transactions, publishes it in a block. And so by having or by removing the ability for say the BP uh, to manipulate the ordering of transactions, uh, we are able to streamline consensus uh, and provide privacy. So this basically just makes use of the fact that CMix and, or, sorry, Elixir mixing and uh, Praxis block producing uh, both process batches or blocks of transactions. And then finally, Elixir technology provides a privacy feature that is unique to our platform. Uh, one important feature of blockchains, if uh, you're familiar with them, is that you have the ability to publicly verify that consensus was completed and that a transaction reached finality. So you would do this, you know, usually by going to a block explorer or if you're running a node by asking another node or receiving a block update. But unfortunately, by asking a node for that block or by using the block explorer to ask for proof that a transaction is final, you've kind of just revealed that you are likely the owner or you are closely related to the owner of that transaction. And so the return path that Ben mentioned in the communication section actually allows us to leverage the privacy offered by mixing to privately return a partial Merkle proof receipt to the sender of the transaction. And using this and a say proof of finality of any block in the future, the user can verify that the transaction was successful without asking the nodes, without using any other server or block explorer uh, for information on the transaction. And so as you can see, we've tried to really integrate Elixir's mix technology and Praxis's blockchain technology so that they're mutually beneficial. And to anchor this point home, I'm gonna hand this off to Ben, who will discuss how these technologies uh, share node resources. So one pretty obvious question here is, okay, how do these things actually share resources? Uh, both seem fairly intensive and it would be reasonable to assume that they would conflict. Um, but that's actually not the case. Uh, the way that we've described before is a little bit like two ships passing in the night. The majority of time they're operating on the same nodes doing different things and don't interfere. So I've put here a simplified graph of resource utilization by Elixir. So during the pre-computation, Elixir has very minimal CPU usage, just using it to uh, package and send uh, um, uh, batches, but it primarily operates on the GPU. Um, while simultaneously, its usage of the network is fairly low. So it uses the network to send short bursts of communications, but most of the time where it's sending communications, it's um, uh, between then it's not using it. So 
it's fairly lightweight on the resources that uh, the Praxis XX consensus will utilize, as we can see on the next slide. So doing uh, block production endorsement doesn't use the GPU, but has heavy CPU utilization and heavy uh, network utilization. Uh, so, but neither of those resources are heavily used by uh, uh, CMIX during its pre-computation operations. And what this does is it allows the two systems to operate almost completely asynchronously. The one exception is that when a, um, a team of nodes is uh, executing the real time uh, for, of CMIX, they use resources that make it difficult for them to participate in Praxis. But this is a small uh, form of the network, a percentage of the network, so of a thousand nodes or 500 nodes, it might be eight. And this is very short and it's known beforehand, so the effects of this can be mitigated through the scheduling algorithm utilized by the XX consensus. So overall, the operations are almost completely asynchronous and the small synchrony that does need to occur is easily mitigated. Um, so, I mean, this is pretty important. If the two conflicted, then they'd either slow each other down um, or have to delay each other completely. So on, uh, so on the next slide, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Alphanet as it currently stands and how it's going to uh, progress. So it's been pretty important to us at, that we have as egalitarian node operators as possible. And this doesn't just mean that they're from all parts of the planet. This also means that they come from varied backgrounds, which includes less uh, technical individuals, um, which means that we need to have a simpler, easier node deployment. So we've currently deployed nodes in two mechanisms. One is through AWS cloud deployment, and we have a pretty much single click uh, deployment infrastructure, which once an account is set up, we have code written in Terraform, which handles the majority of the deployment. And most of our uh, Alphanet nodes currently who've used this process took no more than half an hour to set up their node, and it, we've not actually required them to make any changes since uh, launch in June. And um, we're pretty proud of that actually. We've had pretty good uptime. Um, the other mechanism that we have is for local deployment. So uh, either a co-located uh, in, in another data center or in some, someone's own data center. You can set up servers and set it up uh, uh, on true physical hardware. Uh, estimates say that it takes approximately four hours set up and one has to be more familiar with Linux, but even still it's a relatively simple node deployment. We hope to bring these approaches to Betanet and Mainnet um, and obviously we hope to expand beyond AWS to many other cloud options. But it's really important to have a, a variety of nodes out there on as many platforms as possible because the platforms themselves can be a, a security risk. So we're, we're committed to providing many options for, for, for deployment and uh, uh, setting up the infrastructure. So in the Alphanet itself, as we can see on the next slide, there are eight currently deployed nodes with only five at a time being used. They're primarily currently operating Elixir's uh, mixing technology with some node identity currently built in. Um, uh, of these, five of them are deployed currently using AWS and three are locally managed servers. Um, I think in the long term, we're, uh, we like locally managed servers more than AWS, but it's really important that options are provided across the board. Um, so with that, I think we're going to hand off to Peter and go back, go into some questions that uh, you guys may have.